The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. Took place almost 30 years ago in the Holy Land in Eretz Israel. A very well to do gentleman who calls on all his friends and he asks them to come out to something very special that night. He asks them to come out to Sudat Hoda'a. Now when the friends come out that night and they're sitting around a table lavishing Suda, they turn to the Balabayit and they say, we know you for years. What is the Sudat Hoda'a? What happened? Does something happen in your life that suddenly you're giving Hoda'a? He says, no. For years I've been giving Sudat Hoda'a quietly. I felt this year I have to let everybody know my story. I want to tell you my story. You're my closest friends. But yet, there's a lot about my past you don't know. Tonight you're going to find out. You're going to find it all out. He says, when I was young, it was right after the war, I lost my father. I was growing up in the Lower East Side in New York City. Just me and my mom. At that time, very difficult to make a living. I couldn't go to yeshiva, school. I was out on the streets, hustling and bustling, looking to make every penny I could. And he says, you know how it goes? A kid on the street with no guidance, no structure, no figure, no authority, nothing. And sure enough, he fell into the wrong set of friends. And boy, did they show him how to make money. And he started to make good money. But the money he made was far from legal. He started to fall into all the, wor the worst ways. Has shalom. One would break all the laws for another dollar. He says, I started to make a tremendous amount of money. And little did I know that me and my friends were smack in the middle of an FBI sting operation. And the buyer that turned to me, did I know he was an undercover agent? I thought this was the biggest deal. And in the back of my head, I said to myself, after this deal, I don't have to work anymore. I'm going to stop. And I'm going to put me and mom on easy street. And I really said to myself, after this deal, I'm done. I'm going to go clean. I'm going to go straight. I'm done with these ways. And then when I closed the deal and the buyer opened his jacket and showed me his badge, that was the moment that my life went haywire. I was done. They got me red handed wiretaps and witnesses and every type of proof that you could try to throw the book at somebody, a young guy in his twenties, just starting out in life. Boy, did they have a case against him. And he turns to his friends and he said, I was done. But I had money. I made a lot of money before the last deal. So you know what I did? I went out and I looked for the best lawyer that money can buy. And I found a guy in a very high class, posh office in some high tower in New York City. And I go up to the office and after he already met with the FBI, I put down a large money retainer and I said, I want you to, I want you to represent me. I think you can get me off. And he says, listen, I've gotten off the biggest criminals, but I want to tell you something, kid. They got everything on you. Matter of fact, honest, I don't think you stand a chance. And I wasn't sure if I shouldn't take, even take the case. You know what the one thing you have going for you? Your age. Maybe we'll find the judge a little mercy. He sees a young kid starting out in life. Who would want to send a 22, 23 year old kid behind bars? Such a young age. So if you want, I'll represent you. But I'm telling you right now, we're not guaranteeing any results. Because to my eyes, the case against you, you have no chance. 
When he heard this, he broke down crying. This is his own lawyer talking to him. He says, if that's the case, what am I paying you money for? He says, well, there's the chance. I can get the, I can get the judge to feel a little bit that you can't. He says, okay, you're hired. And with those words, he comes down from the office and he's walking through the streets of New York City and he's bawling, crying. He couldn't believe the words that he really expected some sort of word of confidence. Nothing. He's walking through the streets in the days in New York City. He's crying, he doesn't know where he's going. He's just walking up and down the streets crying. He stumbles into a bar. He sits down and he says, ordering me up a drink, why not? I'm at rock bottom. In walks an old man, sits down right next to him. And as the man reaches over for his drink, his sleeve goes right up to his elbow. He looks down and he sees the numbers on his arm. Hmm. He turns to the old man. The old man turns back to him. Old man says, you look like you could use somebody to talk to. He says, yeah, matter of fact, this is the worst day of my life. But the truth is, old man, I have bigger problems than you could ever know. The old man said, really? You want to see problems? And he rolls his sleeve back up a second time. He says, I survived Auschwitz. I guarantee whatever you're going through is a drop in the bucket from what I lived through. So kid, start talking to me. Let me help you. With those encouraging words, it was the first encouraging words he heard from the worst days of his life. So he opened his heart and he started to tell him everything that the FBI has on him and how many years they think he's going to jail. At that moment, the old man smiles and he says, tell me, do you believe in a Rebbe? A Rebbe? I'm not even religious. I barely had a bar mitzvah. A Rebbe? What type of Rebbe? You know, a holy rabbi. A rabbi that can give you a blessing. A rabbi that can look inside your heart and see the recesses of your soul. You believe in such a thing? Nah, come on. The old man says, well, you better. Because the Skeletor Rebbe is your only chance. Go to him in the Lower East Side. Here's his address. And tell him. Pour out your heart. Tell him your story. Tell him exactly what's going on. Maybe the Rebbe can, maybe the Rebbe can give you a blessing. He says, okay, what do, I have to do? what do I have to lose? At this point, it's only up from here. I mean, my own lawyer turned on me. It's with those words that he goes to the Lower East Side. He knocks on the apartment of the Skeleta Rebbe, Zechet Sadiq Lebracha. He comes into the Rebbe. He sits down. The Rebbe looks up and the Rebbe says to him, I know why you're here. Whoa. Rabbi, you don't know why I'm here. And he says, no, no. I know why you're here. And I know you're in trouble. And I know what they have on you. At that moment, he says, my mouth dropped. I knew I was in the presence of greatness. I said, Rabbi, if that's the case, if you know how bad I'm in this, could you tell me how do I get out of this? The Rebbe smiles and he points up. And he says, God is throwing you a wake up call. He loves you. You're one of his kids. This didn't happen random. And it happened young so that maybe you can have a chance to live like a Jew. Now's your opportunity. Do you believe in Hashem? He says, I'll believe in anything you want me to believe in. Just get me off. He says, no, no, that's, that's not good. That's not going to work. If that's the case, he says, you can leave. He says, I'm going to ask you again. Do you believe in Hashem? He says, I'll tell you the truth. I do. I really do. That moment when the FBI put me in handcuffs, it was the first time I screamed for God. I do. And I know he's the only one that can help me at this point. Says the Rebbe, oh, 
That's what I wanted to hear. The Rebbe sits back and he closes his eyes and he starts to shuckle back and forth. And a few minutes later, suddenly, out of the blue, the Skelena Rebbe starts to laugh. But such a laughing, such a giggling, it was like a laugh of hysteria. It was like a, oh my gosh. And he's, he says, I was looking at the Rebbe like, what, what, what's going on? The Rebbe leans forward and opens his eyes. And he tells me, go to court. And I give you a blessing that your lawyer should not show up. Excuse me, Rabbi. Do you know how much I'm paying this guy? He already gave me a lousy rap. At least let the guy show up. At least let him earn something for what I'm paying him on the retainer, Rabbi. No, no, no. I give you a biracha that your lawyer should not show up. And the Rebbe starts laughing. He's giggling. Okay. Rabbi, everything's going to be good. If your lawyer doesn't show up, everything will be good. And it's with those words that I picked up and I left the apartment to the Lower East Side. The Skelena Rebbe Zechet Sadiq Lebracha. He says, the big day came. And here I am in my best suit. And I walk into the courtroom. And he says, the pachad. <laughs> the fear of looking at the judge and the jury and the people who came. And he says, I have nobody in my corner but Hashem. And I sit down right there in the defendant's spot. And nine o'clock comes. And the judge walks in and everybody rises. And at that moment, the judge grabs the javel and he hits it on the... Ladies and gentlemen, the proceedings are now beginning. I'd like both attorneys to approach the bench. He says, I looked around. My lawyer's not here. Mafi I don't know if that's the same language. I don't know. He's not here. He says, I'm looking around the room. Where is the guy? The guy doesn't show up. The judge is getting very impatient. Uh, sir, where's your lawyer? Where's the defending attorney? Your honor, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> I don't know where this guy is. He didn't show up. What do you mean he didn't show up? Was he making a mockery out of this court? There are very serious charges against you, young man. You don't have somebody to represent you. You know what's going to end up happening. Your Honor, it's not my fault. The guy's not here. He's from the top prestigious lawyer firms in New York City. I don't know what happened to him. He says, okay. The judge says, I'll let you go into the other room. We're going to break for recess for exactly five minutes. I'm going to give you one phone call to the firm. Find out where's your attorney. He says, I got up. I went into the next room. They gave me the phone. I called up the firm. I spoke to the head of the firm. Oh my gosh, I was trying to get through to you. Your attorney got into an accident on the way to the courthouse. But don't worry. He's okay. He's okay? What about me? I'm not going to be okay. What do I do now? He says, don't, don't worry. Don't worry, kid. Don't worry. We're sending you another lawyer. Is he any good? Yeah. Come on. Is he really good? He's good. I'm sending him goodbye. And he hangs up. Ten minutes later, the court resumes. In walks the new lawyer. The whole room turns around as the back door is open. And in walks this young looking kid in a suit with a tie, with a funny little smile, looking down at his manicured nails. And he walks inside, a little cocky. And he walks up to the bench and he says, are you so-and-so? He says, yeah, I'm your attorney. He says, I looked at this kid and I asked him, how old are you? He says, I'm 24 years old. You're 24 years old? They sent me a 24 year old kid to represent my life? Are they out of their minds? I don't want you to be my lawyer. I'm sorry, buddy. I'm your lawyer. They sent me 
I'm representing you. But don't worry, I got this. You got this? He says, yeah. How many cases did you win? This is my first case. <laughs> this is your first case. My life is on the line. I'm looking at it. Lifetime imprisonment. They sent me a 24-year-old kid, fresh out of college, fresh out of law school, barely, barely covered the bar exam, and they sent you to represent me? He says, don't worry. I got this. Okay. I have nobody else. The floor is yours. Well, the judge calls up both attorneys. They walk up to the front. Your Honor, my name is representing. Your Honor, my name is prosecuting. Gentlemen, I'm sure both of you know the ways of the court. The proceedings are about to begin. Opening statements. The prosecutor gets up. Wow. He's holding a tick like this. He has everything on this guy. Wiretaps, witness statements, evidence from here to kazoo. And he puts everything down. Your Honor, this is an open and shut case. Your Honor, there's, there's nothing to talk about. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we're already moving towards life imprisonment. I mean, there's nothing else but guilty. Guilty. Okay. Now, we turn to the defending lawyer. Opening words. He walks up, he looks at his nails with a cocky smile, walks in front of the jury, looks at everybody. My guy, he's innocent. Then he turns around and sits down. The judge is burying his face in his hands. And he says, me, I was already under the table. I wanted to hang myself. He says, this is not going anywhere good. What did they send me? He says the court proceeding started. The prosecution made their case. They start bringing out evidence. I turned to my lawyer. Do something. Object. Say something. Nah. They don't got nothing. They don't got nothing. They got everything. Nah. Don't worry. I got this. You got this. I got this. The lawyer proceedings go on. They call witnesses. The judge turns to the defending lawyer. Do you want to cross-examine the witnesses of the prosecution? No, no, your honor. They look like nice people. Finally, the guy says, that's it, I'm done. This is ridiculous. He turns to his lawyer and he says, aren't you to do anything? He says, yes. He stands up, your honor. My client is innocent. And everything that was brought up until this point is absolutely inconclusive. The other attorney stands up, inconclusive? <laughs> I have wiretaps. I have evidence. I have witnesses. I have everything. Well, at the end of the court, at the end of the case, here were the final remarks. The attorney stands up and he says, Your Honor, I place my case in front of you. I would like to close with life imprisonment, guilty as charged. The judge says, one second. The judge starts reiterating and going over all and everything that was presented by the prosecution. And he starts asking questions. What about this? And how did you get that? And that's not lawful. And he goes through step by step by step, showing that all the evidence that was placed was not as ironclad as it seemed. And in meanwhile, the defense attorney is giving an elbow to his client. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. You see, I told you they have no case against you. This, this is ridiculous. Finally, the closing statements, the defense attorney stands up. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as I said, everything that was presented was inconclusive. My client is innocent. And he sits down. They go into deliberation, they come out. The judge says, ladies and gentlemen, we have the verdict. The judge has a face. He 
He says, we find Mr. So-and-so innocent on all accounts. The guy jumps up. <laughs> Shema Israel. It was a mess. He's hugging his lawyer. The lawyer's hugging him. And they run out of the room. He says, let's get out of here before they change their mind. <laughs> As they're running out of the courtroom, they run into the elevator. He turns to his lawyer, 24-year-old kid. And he says to him, I don't understand. You did nothing. How did you win? How did you get the judge to say innocent? Nah, the judge is my grandpa. <laughs> I came from Brooklyn with good news. The judge is your father. And I want to explain to you in the magnificent words of Tomer Devora what that really means. I know at first it sounds very sweet. No, but I brought here tonight a depth. This isn't a cliche statement. This is something that I'd like to open your hearts because I have a secret to share with you tonight from the magnificent works of Tomer Devora who goes through all the 13 attributes of mercy of Hashem. Tomer Devora goes through the Yud Gimel Midot of Rahamim. And when it comes to Mi'el Kamocha, No Se'avon, V'over Al Pesha, Lish'erit Nahalato. What do the words Lish'erit Nahalato mean? Mi'el Kamocha, who is like you Hashem? No se'avon ve'ovel al pesha that he carries the sins and that he looks away from the wrongdoings and he forgives us in spite of the averot to who lisherit nahalato. What does that mean, lisherit nahalato? Says Tomi Devora. You know what the word lisherit? It's from the lashon of she'er, a relative. We're relatives, says Hashem. Comes the angels in heaven, says Tomer Devora, and says, Hashem, I don't understand. They're guilty as sin. They're guilty as charged. Look at all the evidence from a whole year that's stacked against them. And you know what Borei Olam answers? Lish'erit nahalato. They are my relatives. They're my kids. These are my sons. These are my daughters. How could I punish them? When they suffer, I suffer more watching. As a true father, how parents would suffer more when they watch their kids, when they watch their kids suffering. Says Borei Olam, you want to know the secret of mi el kamocha? No se avon al pesha. What is the secret that we get through year after year with all the averot and the whole case against us? And they have the goods on us. They have more than wiretaps. They have more than witnesses. They have Blu-ray video, black and white, and they show the movie of our life on Oshana. How, how do you deny that one? How do you deny that? And the answer is, Borei Olam says, I'll tell you. Miel Kamocha, who's like you, Hashem? Even with everything against us? No se'avon ve'over al pesha. You know how he does it? Because we are she'erit nahalato. We are she'er. We are his relatives. We are his sons. We are his children, says Tome Devora. Says Borei Olam. You feel for your relative. You give a certain compassion to your relatives. You empathize with your relatives much more than strangers. Says Borei Olam, Klali Yisrael, they're my kids. Bani matem Hashem elokechem. And therefore as a father, even if they deserve to be punished, how do I punish them? By watching them hurt. It'll hurt me more. I suffer when they suffer. We are the ones that are called the Karov to Bore'ola. 
Says Borei Olam, I want you to emulate me. Mahu rachum, afatem rachum. Hanun, hanun. And so too, when Hashem says, you're my relative, Hashem says, we're not strangers. And just like I don't act as a stranger to you, I don't want you to act as a stranger to each other. Let me see the love in Klal Yisrael. Let me see that relative closeness of a family amongst Jews. And that is the greatest saving grace for Kapara. So says Tomer Devora. And says the Tomer Devora, Devora, if Klal Yisrael would have Shalom Benehem, if they would act like relatives one to another, if they would let things go the way relatives let things go one to another, if they would show a certain favoritism to each other the way relatives do show a nepotism and a certain favoritism to each other, then Borei Olam says, then I can act the same way with you. And if that's the case, regardless of what's stacked up against you, you have that love and that closeness, so do I to you. Then I won't act like a stranger to you. Fantastic idea, says Tomer Devora. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to inspire.org.